Good morning, folks. This is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Lecture 8 of Arrow 4080, Finite Elements. Today we're going to be looking at Nastran again, and we're going to be looking specifically at beam and shell elements. Now, now we already looked at beam elements uh, a few lectures ago, uh, but we're going to look at those a little deeper, and we're also going to start looking at shell elements. So stay tuned. So before we get going, uh, we're going to do a really, really fast review just to bring some ideas back to the forefront of our memory. Okay. So remember we saw in arrow 3261 as we looked at a member that's being extended, how its shape changes due to Poisson's effect, right? How it get longer and narrower at the same time. And we saw, without really deriving it, we saw this relation between the, act, the uh, modulus of elasticity, E, and the shear modulus, G, and Poisson's ratio. Okay, we saw that relation, these two relations here. So when we're defining our materials, we're going to use, use both of these parameters, or at least two of the three. Okay, we also looked at a little element, a thin plain stress element loaded in shear. We looked at direct shear and pure shear. Direct shear meaning when we force the thing to, to rotate all in one, holding one edge fixed and making the whole thing uh, rotate like a, is that a trapezoid? And the other one where we see it both uh, shear deflecting in both dimensions as we see like in the skin and like any element in the skin. And we learned about the shear deflection and we saw that the shear deflection was just this little angle of deformation or for example in this case this uppercase here we saw was the deflection in the Y over that length in the X or change in length in the X okay so with this idea in mind we find out if we have an element that's being loaded even neglecting bending we also learned about deflections of beams the bending deflection of beams and when we analyze that remember we spent some time doing singularity functions and all that we focused on the deflection of the beam due to the resistance of the normal uh, the normal cross-section to extending and compressing and because as those resist that stress the beam kind of flops over that happens to be the primary deflection for beam like members but as our members get shorter and shorter and deeper and deeper then that rotation of the element due to the normal stresses becomes smaller and smaller. However, in both cases, we also see this, this uh, shifting of the beam as it shears. That's called shear deformation. Now, normally when we calculated those deflections in 3261, we neglected the shear deflection. We only looked at the deflection due to that stress on the normal face but we're going to find out for certain kinds of beams that shear deflection is no longer negligible. And fortunately, Nastran gives us a method of including that. Of course, it's not just we can't just punch a button, have it included, and expect everything to come out okay because it's actually rather complicated to figure out what coefficients to put in to get the correct shear deflections. So just trying to account for it doesn't necessarily mean your numbers are any better and they might actually be worse. Stick with me. This is also looking at that idea of the shear stress. Remember, shear stress is related to the shear strain through the modulus. This is Hooke's Law for the shearing strains. We looked at that in 3261. So if we look at a beam, a cantilever beam, just to instead of deriving all this, if we just grab what we uh, can find from the other sources, we see if we had looked up the deflection of a beam, we would get this kind of value. If we looked at the shear deflection of the beam, we would get this kind of value. So let's just think about this for a moment. What this first equation means is this beam is subjected to a transverse load, right? 
So cantilever beam subjected to transverse load and as it deflects it deflecting like this. But really what this first equation is based on is it's looking at a cross section and how that cross section gets long, uh, longer up here and shorter down here. And because of that, the beam ends up drooping. These elements here are getting longer, these elements are getting shorter, and that causes droop, which we called deflection. What the shear deflection does, this is where probably 99 plus percent of the, of the deflection analysis done in industry is done analyzing this and neglecting this. Even when you get into finite elements, that's true. What the shear deflection does is it says, okay, forget normal stresses. All we can accounted for here was normal stresses. And we talk about shear stresses. All what this second method does is say, forget the normal stresses. Let's just look at that shear stress. Tau equals P over A. And uh, we know that the shear stress is equal to G gamma. And gamma is just the deflection over the length. If this just rotates like this, notice this thing is not getting, it is not extending axially like this one extended up here and compressed in here. This is not doing that. All it's doing is just seeing this, just like a shear element. When we loaded a shear element like this, it deflects like that some amount. That's all this is doing. It's getting the deflection of this beam just due to the shear area. Now, we can rewrite this to say that the deflection then is equal to gamma L. And if we rearrange this, that means we see that it's just tau over G L, which is just P over A L over G, which we can write over here, P over A L over G. And that means for a cantilever beam, the shear deflection is just PL over AG. That means just due to the shear acting, the beam deflecting like this, excuse me, it's not getting longer, so it's deflecting like this, this deflection is given by that amount. That's the shear deflection. This one is looking at how the beam droops due to this member up here getting longer and this one getting shorter. That causes droop. Without the thing rotating like this, remember the slope anywhere along here is zero, right? Well, we can say, well, if we talk about this, we'll often talk about the slope here relative to that other guy, but basically if you draw a tangent, it's tangent to the beam. In this case, we see we get a definite change in slope right there. Uh, not slope, but the whole thing just kind of rotates down. So this is the deflection we normally calculate due to normal loads. This is the deflection that we normally neglect due to shear loads. As our beam gets longer and shorter in height, this dominates. And actually it dominates for most beams you will see in industry. As the beam gets shorter and stubbier and deeper and deeper, so a beam like this, as it gets shorter, stubbier, and deeper, then this begins to get more and more important to where it's no longer negligible. That's what shear deflection is, okay? And with Nastran, in a few moments, we will get to see how that affects uh, or can be tr accounted for in our analysis. Got that? Okay, so for a cantilever beam, we saw in 3261 that the deflection is PL cubed over 3EI. That's only accounting for the normal stresses and we didn't learn anything about shear deflections. I'm telling you now, and I just derived for you, that the shear deflection is actually PL over AG for a cantilever beam. Now remember, when we plugged in our shear stress for this, we plugged in that the shear stress in that equation was just P over A.
Remember, if we have a rectangular cross section, the shear stress actually is a function with a max that for a rectangular section is 3 halves P over A. What this means is this approximation is not strictly correct. It's the average, it's not the peak. Okay? Now we can't take the peak stress and think that it will deflect based on that stress because the peak stress only happens in a little spot. And it doesn't exactly deflect like the average stress. It deflects something in between. And so we're going to see that there are some factors for different types of cross sections that help us to correct our numbers. But actually, if you just use this for the shear deflection of a cantilever beam, by just using the shear stress, the average shear stress as the stress, you're going to be pretty close to correct. Most anything we do is wrong already because we normally are taking stresses out beyond the elastic limit and pretending that our E is valid. And when we try to account for shear deflections, there are usually a number of things such as also that nonlinearity, but other things that affect our answer that cause it to be off. So a slight error by just neglecting uh, using the average stress rather than the peak stress or the something in between is a nice simplification and it, it refines our answer better than just using this without introducing a lot of complexity. However, I'm going to give you some factors that others have developed that can even purify our numbers slightly more than that. So with that all said, that was a super brief introduction to shear deflection of beams. What do you need to understand at this point? Everything you learned about deflection of beams in 3261 is what most people out there in industry are using. It happens to be just accounting for the normal stresses on the cross section, the deflection due to the normal stress on the cross section, and it happens to be the dominant deflection for most beams you'll run into in industry, aerospace and otherwise. However, there actually is a little additional deflection occurs that occurs due to the shear flexibility of the beam and for a cantilever beam this value I show below here is approximately correct if we have a rectangular section and we assume that the average stress is actually occurring okay now if we on the other hand have a like a simply supported beam another beam we will commonly see then our max deflection we can find from our appendix of our handbook is PL cubed over 4080i and the corresponding shear deflection is this value. You can actually derive this value in the same way we did before by just noting now when we look at this since this is symmetric one half of this P is going this way and one half of it is going this way. So it's kinda like we have two cantilever beams one of them with P over 2, L over 2. Each of them like that. So the deflection then, our shear stress, is now P over 2 over A, and our length is now L over 2. So when we plug those in, we have our deflection equals, uh, let's see, we have stress equals gamma G, right? We have deflection, or uh, excuse me, shear strain equals deflection over length and now so for us this is when we plug that in so now if we rewrite this our deflection is simply L gamma which is tau L tau over G right which is now our length is actually L over 2 our shear is actually P over 2 over A right and we have G which means we have PL over 4 a G that's what we see right here so a simple uh, calculation the same way gives us this relation that we see right here so that's really all there is to it and once again most everybody is neglecting shear deflections out in industry because it's hard even when you try and account for it, it's usually not strictly correct and it's simple.
okay? But you should be aware of that so when somebody asks you to calculate or to account for it, you can talk intelligently, either include it intelligently or explain intelligently why it can be neglected, okay? All right. So we're going to take a look. We're going to actually work mostly with elements we've already seen, right? We're going to look at the bar element. Remember with the bar element we saw before, we saw we're going to call out the C bar. This is actually the preferred element for modeling anything with a bending stiffness, in my opinion. There are increasing numbers of folks that will go and run to the C beam element instead, but the C beam element is going to mostly just bring a lot of output back that you don't understand and count of, can't account for, which increases the chance of you have making an error understanding or uh, extracting the, the loads and stresses you need. Therefore, I recommend the bar element. What are the key characteristics? You're going to have the C bar uh, identifier. You're going to have an element ID, which has to be unique among the elements. You're going to have a property ID of a P bar card. You're going to have the two end, no, end nodes, one to two, and the order in which you specify them will define the x axis of the element. And then you're going to have a third point or a vector to orient the plane, the normal plane, for the section properties of that thing. Okay, As we saw here and we talked about before, we talked about developing a little uh, toy like this to help you extract your FO6 loads and moments and shears and correctly when you're doing analysis. Okay, All right. We also have the ability to put in pin flags. If you put in a pin flag here, as you see here, you can put up whatever digits a digit would indicate. Like if a 1 would mean that it's pinned in the x direction, a 2 would mean it's pinned in the y direction, and so forth, global values. And you can put those in to put pins in your model. It's dangerous to actually do that. You should test out anything you try to use and not just start using those values thinking it's going to give you gospelly correct results. Okay, You can also do a CG offset, a neutral axis offset for that element so that your CG is offset from where the 2, the X, the uh, 1 to 2 plane. So your element is going to go from 1 to 2 and straight down the middle of that is your X and that's what your property is going to be centered around unless you specify an offset WAWB which can move where that centroid is. I actually don't recommend doing that either. It adds more complexity. There are some things that can happen to your results that will be wrong. If you do that, uh, I'm not even going to say carelessly, if you don't do that super carefully, and so it's better just not to use it unless you have a lot of experience modeling beams and accounting for that parameter, backed up by hand analysis on simple uh, representative cases okay and then we also have the ability to put a preload if our little bar is modeling a bolt or something okay we saw all that before this was our coordinate system uh, of the bar and how the loads and stuff comes out and i gave you a little template last time for making your little bar orienter so you can extract your loads correctly if I have you extract stresses out of your model, it will be really easy to do that wrong unless you have one of these. Make one of these yourself and mm, carefully pull out each load. Okay. There are some comments about it, what we can do with the element. We talked about these before and we talked about this before. It being basically the same as a C bar but simpler. Okay. All right. Whenever we have a C bar card, we need the P bar card, which gives our properties. Our property ID matches whatever was called out in the other. We can have different property for every bar. We can have one property for all bars, whatever. Okay. We're going to have our area, field four, our moment of inertia in the two directions. Remember, we have those two planes. It's a little different. A lot of times we're talking about moment of inertia. IX is the moment of inertia about the X. Well, in this case, I1 is not the moment of inertia about the one. Remember, it's the moment of inertia in the one plane. So it's a little different terminology. You got to be careful about that. You can have a torsional constant and other stuff. Okay, we talked about all this. Now, what we didn't talk about is this continuation card. If you put like a little plus, 
P-bar with the ID is usually what I do. And then in the first field of the following card, you have plus P-bar with the ID. Uh, then you have the continuation card. We call out a K1, K2 if you want. So normally what NASTRAN does is it assumes K1 and K2 are zero. This means the beam has no shear stiffness. This means that when you get deflections out of Nastran, it does not have, uh, it will not calculate any deflection due to shear. It only is giving you those deflection due to normal stresses, okay? However, if you put an entry, a non-zero entry for K1 or K2, it will then calculate the shear deflection using a factor. Now, if you use a factor of one, like we saw for a cantilever beam before, that rectangular cantilever beam before, then you're gonna get exactly this equation with a K equals one, right? That's gonna give you exactly the result of what I calculated before for a cantilever beam. But remember, I told you that that result was for a rectangular section when we're accounting for the average stress. And actually, Rourke has come up with some values and actually some predecessors to him. He says that actually if you put in a K of 5 sixths, which actually means you're 6 fifths that PL over AG value that we calculated before, that will give you a slightly more accurate number. That would be if you have a rectangular section, if you have a circular section, you only use 9 tenths and so on. So you can put in these factors if you want to get a better number for your shear deflection. However, just putting a 1 in that K will account for some shear deflection. And since most of these factors, this K for a rectangular section and K for a circular section are nearly 1, you'll notice you're not losing much by that. Okay? You get a slightly different number for like I-beams, and you'll notice that those, num uh, those formulas are by obviously quite approximate. So they were probably better the number than just using a K equals a 1, but they may not be worth the hassle of calculating the risk of introducing error. So basically, whenever we run Nastran, we normally will run, use, if with bar elements, we'll use P-bar cards with the uh, C-bar cards with the P-bar card. We will not include the continuation, which means we're getting zero shear stiffness of the beam, which means all we're getting when we get our deflections is the normal deflection, the normal this nor deflection during due to normal loads. This means if you have a very simple model like a cantilever beam, simply supported beam, or any of the edge constraints that we have in our handbook, you should be able to run a NAST, simple Nastran model to idealize it and get exactly the same numbers as your hand analysis within just the error or the round off errors of the program running those numbers. Does that make sense? If you include shear stiffness or flexibility, what you should see is a little more deflection than you would calculate just accounting for those normal deflections, those normal deflections due to normal stresses. So it should be very close to the same number. That's why we're saying it's negligible, but you should get a little more deflection. It's not like we're uh, finding the stiffness reduces deflection even more. What happens is it deflects due to the normal stresses and it also deflects due to the shear stresses. And when you add those two numbers together, that gives you the total deflection of the beam. Make sense? Okay. We're only going to just dabble in this a little bit. One of the projects will let you explore that idea a little bit. Other than that, just understand the concepts. Okay. All right. We saw this little tool before. You can make your own. If you make one of these with the nodes and the planes, it will help you in the moment shown on there. It will help you to interpret your NASTRAN results better. Okay? I recommend take the time. Get a piece of cardboard that you can write on, that you can see what you write on it, cut it, slide it together. I tape mine also. I drew it all up before I put it all together. That will make it much easier to orient your loads correctly. Okay? All right, so let's look at some new cards. Let's look at the C quad card. We have a number of thin plate-like elements in aircraft, like skins and floor beam webs and things like that. We've got two major cards that we're gonna use a lot, C quads and C shears. The C quad, we're gonna focus on the C quad four. There's actually just a C quad card. I don't recommend using that. 
and there are C quad eight and other cards. I don't recommend using those. Those are for professionals who actually have done a lot of work. That doesn't mean other people aren't using those cards, but to their own detriment mostly. Stick with the C quad four. It's relatively simple. It's straightforward. Stick with what you know. Implement it well. Understand your approximations and idealizations, and your numbers will be close enough for government work. For 99 plus percent of the work you will do. Okay. With the C quad four card, this means we have a quad element and it's going to have four nodes. Okay. The C quad eight just lets you put midpoint nodes. We don't need that. It's extra complication for no purpose. Okay. Or at least not a purpose that very many people actually need. We're going to have the C quad four card. Or, or a field, we're going to have the element ID again. We're going to have a property ID of a P shell card, if we just have a normal shell element or plate element, or a P comp card if you want to do composite work. You can use a P comp card. You can actually do that with a P shell card if you calculate the effective properties, or you can use a P comp card to calculate all that for you if you've never done that before. We then have four nodes. Once again, the order of the nodes is going to be very important. I'm gonna, we're going to talk about this on the next slide, but let's get a sneak preview. Just like with the bar, the order of node picking is important. So if we call out a node here, one, and we call out a node here, two, and a node three, and a node four, our element is going to be defined like this. Our x is going to be going like from x one to two, and this is going to be going, this is going to be our y, okay? except that these are going to be located like at the element centroid. Now we're going to see on the next slide that if you have a wacky element, which is, say, a little skew, that's going to screw up the angle at which the loads are. So where this one, we can see the F in the X direction is like this, the F in the Y direction is like this. In this one, it's going to be off at some approximate value, which is going to tend to screw up your results. Got that? So let's keep our elements simple and let's strive whenever we can to make them normal and square and not have wacky elements whenever we can help it. That will make our analysis job easier and it will make the results we pull out more accurate. However, it's not possible many times to have only square and normal elements, and so we're going to have to dive into weird looking elements. Let's take a look at how it works, okay? Let's see, we've got the thickness. Uh, okay, now what this allows us to do is call out, uh, let's see, theta is our angle material direction. I don't recommend using that. Zoffs is the element offset. Don't use that either unless you're a professional, okay? Now, if we have a uniform thickness element, or if we're going to idealize our element as being a uniform thickness, which is probably the best approach for most work we're going to do, probably all work as students and most work in industry, then we won't use this continuation card to call out our thicknesses. We will use the P shell card, we'll call out the thickness there. You don't want to call it out both places. If you want to put in different thicknesses, you use the continuation card and you put your thickness at each node in the C quad card and you don't put it on the P shell card, okay? However, if you have a constant thickness element or you're going to pretend that it's constant, don't put the thickness here, put it on your P shell card. So we should, for our purposes, we're going to use fields one through seven and no more for all of our work, okay? This is the C quad actual coordinate system. What you'll see here is remember when we had a, a normal element, one where all the sides are normal to each other, then our coordinate system was really simple to see. It was from one to two for the X and from one to four in the Y, starting from the CG of the element, the middle of the element. Whenever we have a skew element like is shown here, we've got to draw these diagonals and then bisect these angles to get what the real directions are. What this means is the output is not, so if you have, you're pulling all your output from your FO6 and you're normally looking at the running loads or running moments and you're thinking they're aligned, that the X is aligned with the Z axis, 
but if you have any skew elements, those moments are going to be off at a slightly different angle, which means they'll be different, which means it's really easy to misinterpret them. So avoid having skew elements whenever you can. Keep your elements rectangular whenever you can. And whenever you get an element that's not following that, just take the results with a grain of salt. Okay? This is now, this is what the forces and moments look like on the element you'll notice this doesn't follow the right hand rule and it doesn't follow any other logic that you're probably going to think of. Now the X, F, the force in the X, the force in the Y, those make sense. The force in the Z, those make sense. Are you with me? What doesn't make sense is the moments which we'll see here. You'll notice those seem to be all wacky and they're defined differently. Normally we'd say MX would be the moment about the X, but what this is, is MX is the moment on the X face. You'll notice on the positive X face, MX is running in the negative direction, and on the negative face it's running in the positive Y direction. And for MY, that's the moment on the Y face, on the positive Y face, the MY is running in a positive X direction and it's opposite on the other side. You'll notice all the moments are equal and opposite. All the forces that are shown here are equal and opposite. The stresses are shown down below and this is showing our normal sign convention tensor notation for the shear and normal stress on an element. Got that? So this is another place where we're making a little element uh, with all these, this gnomon can make it a lot easier to de extract your results from the FO6 correctly for doing later hand analysis. I actually have one of those too, and I believe I left it at school, so I can't show it to you, and it looks like I didn't scan it last time. It's actually rather simple to take these two diagrams and create your own. Got it? Now, once we've defined our P quad card, we need to call go to our P shell card, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to put in our property ID, our material ID, and our thickness. Remember that thickness needs to be blank if you place the four thicknesses on the other on the PC quad card. If those were blank and we had no continuation, which I recommend highly, then we will have our thickness right here in field four. Okay. Now here's where we have another thing. So what you'll notice the only thing we need for this is field one, two, and three, but most of the time we're gonna have fields one through four. Okay, now here's where it gets a little tricky. Here's how it works. If you have, we, we tend to think of everything as taking all loads, but if we have a membrane like this, okay, what's gonna happen is it has, what membrane action is, remember we looked at membrane action, we were talking about hoop and longitudinal stresses. You're going to have to put at least material one. When you put material one, that means this member, this plate member, is going to have axial stiffness. That means it can develop loads like this, right? This would be running load in the X. This would be a running load in the Y. And these will be the running loads, the shear running loads on the element. When you put in a material ID here, these are the stiffnesses and the loads you're going to get out of the element. You won't get any bending. That means the thing is like it's infinitesimally thick and it has no resistance to bending at all. Zero. It only has resistance to extending and shearing. For many of our thin plate members in aerospace, like floor beam webs, skins, all we need, all we want, is material property one in field three, nothing else. And that means what we will be interpreting out of our FO6 file, we will get running loads in the X direction, running loads in the Y direction, running loads in the shear direction. This means the stress in the X direction is just NX over T. The stress in the Y direction is NY over T. The shear stress on the element is just NXY over T. That's nice and simple, easy to understand. It matches what you've learned. So we saw that we're going to get material property one. We're always going to put in a value there. Usually it'll be material one, unless you have a lot of materials in your model, right? Now, if we put in, and we're going to generally have a thickness, so we're going to have a property ID, 
we're going to have a thickness and a material one. Now, if we put a value here, we don't need to. If we do, what that does is it imposes bending stiffness. If you put a value there, now your element, let me draw it differently, will not only have running loads in the x, y, and z, still going to have those, but now it will also have moments Moments and torques, that's going to give us one, two, three, four more values of output, all those moments. What that means is now, instead of just having to deal with the stresses being N over T, we also have to calculate an MC over I or a 6M over BT squared kind of number to get the additional stress due to bending. Now, if the member is thin like a skin on a very large member, then the bending in the skin is mostly negligible. And if you want to calculate it, you usually can just add that in by hand later. There's no reason to impose all the extra equations in your finite element model simply to get some numbers for a negligible stress that can be calculated by hand like due to local bending on a stiffener or something. So usually we're just going to have this be zero or just not even put it there at all, okay? But if we do want to actually calculate, like let's say we have a plate and we have a plate with bending on it, a bunch of plates, let's say we have a membrane, some a horizontal pressure panel, there's pressure on this thing and it's fixed out here and we want to look at all the detailed stresses, our model's made of a bunch of elements like this, then actually we're going to need that bending stiffness to get an appropriate to get that bending response. But when we're talking about a coarse model of a full fuselage, we'll normally just pretend that the members, the skins have no bending stiffness. Does that make any kind of sense? Okay, so we can, we're always gonna have a material property in field three. We're gonna put one in field five if we want bending stiffness included. Now, normally that's all we need if we want bending stiffness. And when it calculates the stress, it will be using the I as 112 BT cubed of that skin. But let's say you have a skin that's actually not just a continuous plate. Let's say it's got, it's like isogrid where it has different thicknesses. This card allows you to take in that into account, recalling that your bending stiffness is I equals 112 BH cubed or BT cubed. You can actually back that out and calculate, well, what I do you actually have per unit inch of the thing? And put that I in here, multiply by 12 divided by T cubed, put that number in this next for P field six, and that allows you to tweak the bending stiffness a little bit. Okay? All right. There are actually more complicated property cards that can be used with a C quad element that will do some of those things for like an isogrid kind of thing or a composite kind of thing. But this gives us some capability to do the same kind of thing with just a simple parameter. Okay? Now, if we put in this, now remember, with when we put in a one in field three, a uh, uh, material ID, that gave us membrane stiffness, which included extensional NX, NY, and the shear NXY. Okay, those are always included on this card because you're gonna always have to have a uh, membrane stiffness in this guy. However, if you want transfer shear stiffness, meaning it's got resistance to bending for a shear load, point load in the middle, then you can put in a material card, a material ID in field seven and you can actually tweak your stresses by using this TS over T parameter, okay? And if you want to use a non-structural mass per unit area, don't be confused by this word mass. Remember, in the US system units, one pound, one pound mass weighs one pound force, which means you can just plug in the pounds force per unit area or the weight per unit area in this parameter and it will give you correct results if all your other units are consistent. Okay. All right. And then there's some other things you can do. Don't use those. All right. Now the shear card is an even more complicated card and it used to be used a lot in industry because it simplified, reduced the equation significantly. It has some special characteristics which are kind of cool. So the problem with using quad elements for skins is that it gives you assumes it gives you the stiffness of the entire skin. 
And back in 3271, we saw that the thickness of the whole skin was not effective because we learned about effective widths. What the C shear card does, it allows you to account for the effective widths uh, more readily than a, a C quad card will. Okay, so you're going to call it the card this a similar way. You're going to call it a C shear, give an element ID, a property ID, and four grid points with a similar orientation. Are you still with me? Okay. This is where it starts to deviate. Then you go to your P shear card. You're going to only have one material ID. Fine. You're going to have the thickness of your shear panel. Fine. And you can still do this non-structural mass. Remember, everything five and on is optional. Okay? Now, here's how it works. You actually can call out. So what this does is, now remember in 3271, we saw, once again, that our skins in the fuselage, due to buckling and things, right? If our skin is in tension, it might be fully effective. I said it may be less, but it sometimes will be or accounted for as being fully effective. But if we're in compression, we know the skin will tend to buckle out. So we have 30T. However thick the skin is times 30 is how much effective width that works with the stringers. You remember all that? Okay. We can actually account for that here. Here's how it works. If we put in F1, if we put a 1, then this is going to be, it's going to actually calculate our axial stiffness as if that whole panel, that whole skin is effective. If you put a one here, this is going to behave near identically to how a C quad will. The difference is the output will look different. A C quad will have output in the C quad section. A C shear will have output. It will call out these edge forces that you will then have to go extract and add to your axial members. So you have to be careful. This requires more care. There is no reason to use a shear card that I can think of with an F1 equals to 1 unless you're just evaluating how the card works relative to a C quad 4 card. Okay? Now, let's say you have your skin and you say, oh, I want my skin to be only 30% effective, which means like 30% of the thickness, or 70% effective. Well, all you need to do is say, well, if you want a 70% effective, put in a uh, uh, point 0.7 in there and that point 0.7 then will give you that percentage effectivity right if f1 is less than one basically then it's going to take it as a percentage so if it's point 0.7 it's going to say 70 percent if it's point 0.3 it's going to be 30 percent which basically means that you're now you'll notice that the p quad the p shear Remember, the C quad can be used for normal, for uh, excuse me, for membrane stresses, and also it can be used for bending and transverse shear stresses. The C shear card only is valid for shear and membrane stresses. Okay, so that's why you only have one material card. Okay, so if you put in a one, it's going to behave just like a membrane C quad four which means you only had a material ID in that first spot. If you put in something less than one, it's going to take that fraction, that 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, as a 70%, 80%, 30%, 50% effectivity, which means it's like your skin is only half as thick and it's acting like a membrane. However, when you look at your output, you're going to have to go and grab those edge forces and then add them into your any adjacent elements in order to get the correct stresses in the adjacent elements like the stringers and things okay now let's say you want to actually just say well i don't want to do some percentage that makes no sense to me i learned about effective widths that's all as a function of the thickness like 30t 15t or maybe more 23.3t or something okay if you put in an F1 that's larger than 1, the Nastran is going to think you mean, oh, this person is trying to use effective widths. And then it will be a fraction of the thickness, which basically means it will take whatever area is associated. Let's say you put 30 in there. If you put 30 in there, Nastran say, oh, look, F1 is 30 is larger than 1.01. Therefore, they're talking about effective widths. That means this person wants 30 times the thickness, which means it's going to take 30 times the thickness of that element, so if the element is 
then it's going to be 30 times 0.1, which could be 3 inches, is going to be added to the axle. That's how much axial stiffness on that edge will occur and on the other edges. If you put in a 23, it will put in 23T of axial stiffness. Does that make sense? That's how those parameters work. And then you have to be more careful in extracting your output. Okay. With NAS, it's, you can also put in an F3 and F4, which basically means if you want all the edges to be different, if you put in just for the one and the two, then that will basically uh, apply your whole plate the same way. What some NASTRAN versions will allow you to do is put in two more values, different ones at each edge, which is a little dangerous, and NASTRAN won't let you do it. It just gives you two directions. And for our purposes, whatever we put into F1 should also be an F2. Okay? All right. The rest of the PowerPoint was designed to refresh your memory about some principles we learned in Arrow 3271 and some of the challenges associated with modeling those things. We're actually uh, not really going to go into that today. You can read through that at your leisure. Go back to your Arrow 3271 notes and review that stuff. Uh, today we're just focusing on how to use those simple bar, C bars, C quads, C shears. These are three elements that we should use a lot. We're going to use rods, bars, quads, and occasionally shear elements as aerospace engineers. Okay. In the past, everything would have been shear elements nearly. Uh, but folks are tending to use higher order elements. So we're actually going to skip over this section and just focus on what we learned, okay?